Hello. In this video, we are going to derive all of the molecular vibrations of boron trifluoride using the Kim method. Recall that boron trifluoride is a trigonal planar molecule where the fluorine boron fluorine bond angles are 120 degrees, which reminds us that boron is sp2 hybridized in this particular compound. We recognize that this molecule belongs to the point group D3H, and within the Kim method, the first step is to find coordinates for each of the symmetry equivalent atoms, which here are the three fluorine atoms. We will allow this to be the x-axis, and this makes a equilateral triangle, so we can actually plot out the general shape of our compound here, and then we'll have coordinates for the fluorine atom there, there, and there. We recognize that the center of the equilateral triangle is the origin, which would have coordinates of 0, comma, 0, and I'm just leaving that out just to avoid cluttering everything up. If this is the center of the equilateral triangle, then this distance to the right of the origin is going to be 2 times the square root of 3 over 3, and the y coordinate is going to be 0 because it's along the x-axis. This point here is a distance square root of 3 over 3 to the left of x, so its x coordinate is going to be minus square root of 3 over 3, and its y coordinate is going to be 1. Similarly, for this point, it's the same distance to the left of the origin as this point, so its x coordinate is also going to be minus the square root of 3 over 3, and its y coordinate is going to be a minus 1. Next, we think of the bond connecting boron to a particular fluorine atom as a vector directed from boron to the fluorine. So our first boron-fluorine bond, we can think of it as a vector going from the origin to this particular point here, and we'll call that R1. Similarly, we can think of the boron-fluorine bond here as a vector going from the origin to this particular point, which we will label R2. Similarly, completing the idea, we can think of the boron-fluorine bond here as a vector, a directed segment. It ends at this particular point, and we'll label that as R3. Next, we note that in the character table for D3H, the irreducible representation A1 prime has a basis function x squared plus y squared. So now, within the Kim method, the coefficient for each of the r1, r2, or r3 vectors within this irreducible representation are given by substituting the, the values of x and y for that particular point into the basis function. So if we do that for r1, y squared is simply 0 squared x squared is the square of 2 times the square root of 3 over 3, which gives us 12 ninths, which is, we can reduce to 4 thirds. And similarly, for R2 and R3, we have exactly the same coefficient of 4 thirds. Now, ultimately, this is a solution to the Schrodinger equation for the problem of the harmonic oscillator. And therefore, we know that if we have a solution of the Schrodinger equation, that if we multiply that solution by any constant, we will also have a solution. So therefore, ultimately, uh, in more advanced work, we would 
reduce this and put a so-called normalization constant in front. For the time being, we don't need a normalization constant. We realize we can multiply, multiply through the entire equation by three quarters to give each coefficient a value of one. So that gives us R1 plus R2 plus R3 for the A1 prime stretch for boron trifluoride. Next, we can look at the E prime irreducible representation. And we realize this is a doubly degenerate representation. And the first of the basis functions that we can use is x. So the value of x of the particular point will be the coefficient for the appropriate vector. So we notice for the first case, for r1, we have 2 times the square root of 3 over 3 times r1. The coefficient for r2 is minus the square root of 3 over 3 times r2. And similarly for r3, the coefficient is again going to be minus square root of 3 over 3 times r3. But we notice also, similarly as to the last case, that we can multiply by 3 divided by the square root of 3 through here, and we end up getting that the first coefficient will end up being a 2. The second coefficient will be a minus 1. And the coefficient for the third case will be also a minus 1. So using this fact uh, about solution to the Schrodinger equation, we find that the final vibration gives us 2R1 minus R2 minus R3 corresponding to the x basis function. We also have a basis function of y, and we also just use the value of y in this particular uh, formula of the y to give us the coefficient. So we see the coefficient for R1 is simply going to be the zero. The coefficient for R2 is going to be a positive one. So we have R2 because the value of y is one there. And the value of y for R3 is minus one. So that gives us a coefficient of minus one. So the second partner uh, for E prime of vibrations is going to be R2 minus R3. And this gives us all three of the stretching motions for boron trifluoride. Next, we want to find the bending motions for boron trifluoride. And we can represent the bending motions as a vector that bisects a particular angle. So we have the angle going from R1 to the origin to R2. And if we have a vector in this direction, call this bend one. Similarly, we can have a line that bisects R2, origin R3, and we can call this B2. And last but not least, we have the third bending motion, which goes between R1 and R3, and we'll call this B3. Just as before, we need to assign coordinates to these particular values. And since we've already figured out the coordinates for R1, R2, and R3, by symmetry, we can determine what the coordinates for B1, B2, and B3 have to be. So B2 is maybe the easiest because we're simply going along the x-axis. So we know that the y value is 0, and the x value has to be minus 2 times the square root of 3 over 3. And then the y value is going to be 0. Similarly, for B1, we knew that um, to get to R2, we had to go minus the square root of 3. So this has to be positive square root of 3. And a y value of 1. Last but not least, for B3, the x-coordinate has to be exactly the same. It has to be square root of 3 over 3. But the y-coordinate is going to be minus 1. And now that we've defined the coordinates for these particular vectors, B1, B2, and B3, we can again apply the Kim method to determine what these normal modes of vibration actually look like. Our first bending motion is again going to be an A1 prime, and we recall that the basis function for this in this point group is x squared plus y squared. And similarly, so if we take 
uh, the y value here being 0, so y squared is 0. The x value is minus 2 times the square root of 3 over 3, and we square that. Again, we get our 12 ninths or 4 thirds. And we get the same coordinates for b1 and b3 also. So we have 4 thirds b1 plus 4 thirds b2 plus 4 thirds b3. And as we recall, we can multiply through by any constant and still get a solution. So we'll cleverly decide to multiply through by 3 quarters. And that will give us coefficients of 1 for b1, for b2, and b3. For e1 prime, we have two different basis functions. The first, again, we'll use will be the x value. So we know for b1, the x coordinate is going to be square root of 3 over 3 times b1. For the b2, we have minus 2 times the square root of 3 over 3. And then for b3, we have plus the square root of 3 over 3 times b3. Again, by making clever use of the properties of solution to the Schroeder equation, we can multiply through and we get the result. And multiply by minus 1 will also help flip things around to make it more tidy. We get 2 times b2 minus b3 minus b1. For the second member of the e1 prime pair, we use the y basis function, and we notice that the coefficient for b1 is simply 1, and the coefficient for b3 is minus 1, whereas the coefficient for b2 is 0. So this gives us that the second of the bending motions for the e1 prime irreducible representation is b1 minus b3. So recall that we can interpret the coefficients of these functions as, if it's a positive value, we can think of the bond or the um, angle increasing. When the coefficient is negative, we think of it getting smaller. And when we have coefficients that are twice as big as another coefficient, this tells us that the change in the bond angle here is twice as big as the reduction in the bond angle we get for B3 and B1. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a good one.